Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Science in the Age of COVID-19 seminar series. As always, we're glad to have everyone with us here today. Well, it gives us immense pleasure to welcome Dr. Joseph Derizi to our seminar series. Dr. Derizi is a co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub and a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at UCSF. Professor Derizi studies parasitic and viral infectious diseases in a wide range of organisms using an interdisciplinary approach combining genomics, bioinformatics, biochemistry, and bioengineering. A little bit about his work. Early work in his lab contributed to the identification of the SARS coronavirus in 2003. In a parallel effort, Dr. Derizi studies Plasmodium falciparum, the causative agent of the deadliest form of human malaria. Dr. Derizi was one of the early, early pioneers of DNA microarray technology and whole genome expression profiling. And more recently, through his role as a co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, he has redirected his efforts to providing large-scale, rapid, turnaround clinical COVID-19 testing through a UCSF Biohub collaboration called the CLIA Hub. I guess we'll hear more about that today. Professor Derizi, welcome. Thanks for all that you're doing and thank you for taking time off of your busy schedule to come and talk to us today. Great, thanks everyone. I'm gonna share my screen right now and uh, get this started. Okay, you should all be able to hear, uh, I mean, see my slides and hopefully hear me. Um, all right, so uh, if we're ready to go here, thanks for having me. It's always great to be back here uh, talking with my colleagues at HHMI. I had a really positive and great experience while being part of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And it's just uh, always an honor to come back and, and, uh, and, and work with all, all of you. So today it's going to be a little unconventional seminar. You know, it's not my usual seminar. It's going to be talking about the things that we've been doing during COVID, which are sort of not what we usually do. And so that'll be a little different. And I'll give you uh, both published and new results that are not published that I think will be interesting to you all from both an epidemiological and uh, virology, uh, virological perspective. So first of all, I am representing the Biohub and UCSF. Uh, we are a nonprofit founded to understand the fundamental mechanisms of disease uh, with an eye towards diagnostics and therapeutics. And of course, we are really interdisciplinary. We have a, a lot of emphasis on engineering and technology development, and that's sort of integral to a lot of things we do. Um, we're really broken up into like the people, projects, and platforms sort of concept. Uh, and for today's talk, rather than sort of going over a whole you know, review of what the Biohub actually does. I want to get to the meat of the subject, which is about COVID. And that falls squarely into our infectious disease initiative, which is really built on these four pillars of detection, response, treatment, and prevention. Uh, these are our group leaders shown below who run uh, the infectious disease initiative. And Andreas Pushnik is a fellow and John Pack is our protein science um, fellow that uh, supports the group leaders, Christina, Emily, Amy, and Lily. Lily's a fellow too. And um, these uh, group leaders have a variety of different projects in the pre-COVID area. And to give you some history of how we got to where we are now, uh, one of those projects I have to highlight, and that's the Global IDC portal, which is part of our rapid response unit with Christina Tata overseas. And uh, why and what, what that connection is to COVID will become clear in a second. So what is IDC? Why is it important? IDSeq is basically a, a cloud-based platform that really enables others to use the power of metagenomic sequencing, the ability to sequence everything in a sample to understand what might be in it with specific emphasis on infectious disease. We've been doing that obviously in clinical medicine here in California uh, for a long time for neurological infectious disease in particular, but the burden of infectious disease, you know, pre-COVID lies uh, in low and middle income countries largely. Now, obviously that's different today, and we'll talk about that. But uh, the idea was to deploy metagenomic sequencing globally, worldwide, 
um, through an integrated sort of workflow. And samples would be um, acquired locally at the discretion of the people uh, in those areas and what the problems are they're working on. They would be sequenced, hopefully at their own labs, and then this stuff would get uploaded to the cloud where the IDC pipeline could then map out all the reads and understand what is the host, what is non-host, what infectious agents might lie within there. That's the general concept. And the whole idea of building this platform was really to partner with a lot of different um, global public health entities like CDC, WHO, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Institute Pasteur, and many others, and create an ecosystem that would allow these sequencing sites to spin up around the world to create basically a real-time monitoring network for emerging infectious disease. That was the idea, basically a molecular based network that would provide real-time data that are centrally aggregated in the cloud through IDC. Because um, nothing like that has really existed before. Um, and so that, that was the idea. And of course, the Biohub not only would provide a lot of the compute and storage together with CZI, but also training, both training hands-on in field and in California and remotely through kind of like a 24 seven, you know, support network. So that was the idea. And uh, in 2019, you know, in 2019 and 18, we really spent some time spinning this up. And our first pilot case was actually in Dhaka, Bangladesh. This is in Dhaka Sishu Hospital with, um, we work with one of our really close collaborators there. Um, uh, uh, and th this has really been a great collaboration in which we've been able to set up sequencing in Dhaka at a hospital like this and use it in this case for mainly met, uh, childhood meningitis. Uh, and so um, this was a, an amazing sort of collaboration because it demonstrated that they could actually complete all the molecular biology on their own in DACA with you know, very little assistance from us and then use the cloud compute pi pipeline to be able to process that data, which has often been the rate limiting step in being able to utilize genomic data in some of these low and middle income countries is access to compute and storage, not necessarily the sequencing, which has become cheap. This is a screenshot of uh, the graphical user interface for IDSeq. It shows the result for a five-day-old uh, neonate with meningitis, who they thought, they were convinced that this kid actually had uh, some kind of bacterial meningitis. But it turns out, when you look at the data, and so it's shown graphically here, sort of a, you know, a, like a phylogram, the weight of the evidence suggests that um, there's chikungunya virus in the CSF of this child. And so this is a mosquito-borne illness. It's a nasty virus. It causes a lot of, um, it causes a lot of, of discomfort and pain, but in children, it could kill them. Uh, there's also another virus in there called primate tetraparvovirus 1. We're actually not really sure what that's doing in there. But what this th then highlighted is that they actually had a lot of childhood chikungunya meningitis, which was not really appreciated. In fact, chikungunya is not thought to be a neuroinvasive virus by its nature. However, uh, in a retrospective study of other samples in DACA, they found a lot more of it than they ever thought was there. So it's the power of understanding what you didn't expect and what you didn't see coming. Uh, and so this was a, a successful pilot. And so we launched with Bill Melinda Gates, a Grand Challenges Exploration Project to attract more countries to do this. And uh, 11 countries total have been spinning up these sites. And that's what we were doing in 2019 and into the early days of 2020. So in January 2020, I found myself in Phnom Penh in Cambodia, working with the team there to set up one of these sequencing sites to detect emerging new viral infections uh, in, in a country like Cambodia and specifically in Phnom Penh in this case. Uh, and so that was going great. We have the system up and running. And so fast forward to the end of January when you know, the global map for COVID-19 looked like this. Uh, you know, there's only 81 deaths on the map. You know, we're approaching a million deaths worldwide and 200,000 in the US now. It's just so hard to imagine that less than a year ago, it looked like this. Um, but the reason I bring this up is because in late January, one of the first cases of coronavirus were reported in Cambodia. And through our collaboration with the Pasteur Institute and the IDC project, they were able to not only detect it, but actually um, put it through the IDC pipeline and recover the full length genome, you know, and this is like January 20, 24th, 25th of uh, COVID-19 exported from China into Cambodia as one of the first 
non-Chinese uh, viruses uh, or non-viruses, non, uh, you know, not sequenced in China viruses to be captured outside. Uh, and it shows how the pipeline can work and provide sort of full length genomes and export those to a public resource like GISAD very, very quickly. Um, and so we were actually thinking at the end of January, this is going to be like SARS-1. We thought this is, you know, it's going to be limited to sort of China and maybe some really close partners, but um, it's probably going to die down like SARS-1 did. What we didn't know was that 50% of the people who have this virus are asymptomatic and have very high viral titers, which was not the case in SARS-1. And uh, not knowing that uh, was, um, uh, you know, a very unfortunate thing because it obviously led to great spread. So end of January, we're sort of feeling like maybe this is under control, you know, patting ourselves on the back a little bit, not having to worry about our own backyard. But um, as we approached into uh, late February, obviously we began to freak out because we quickly learned that this thing was not under control, was spreading rampantly and uh, very quickly, you know, spreading throughout the United States and European countries. And that is when we really started questioning ourselves about what we were going to do because, um, you know, while our efforts overseas were, were fun, we had the problem right in our own backyard. So what are we gonna do to be involved? Could we surveil asymptomatics? I mean, that would be something useful. There was, you know, really concern about the asymptomatic spread. And so we wanted to get more at that, but it's a little unsatisfying because you wouldn't be able to report the result to people. And we'll talk more about it in a minute. We could get into drug development, but many others were also doing that at the same time. Vaccine development, we weren't really well positioned for vaccine development in the way that like a Pfizer or AstraZeneca was. So um, we definitely could make protein and do some basic science there, but we didn't think a huge push into vaccines would, you know, that we would make a big difference in that area. But what about clinical testing? I mean, in our own backyard, what we realized is there was just a lack of testing. At that time, you either had to send it to the CDC or a state lab and hope that they could get to it. And turnaround times were abysmal. There was a lack of confidence about the tests. Things just weren't very good. Now, you know, we have a big staff and we have a bunch of you know, grad students and postdocs that are all on stay-at-home orders, twiddling their thumbs. So couldn't we just you know, fire up our PCR machines and start testing people? That was sort of the, um, the idea at the time. And, you know, the, the, uh, the answer to that is you, you absolutely, you know, you absolutely uh, cannot do that. You just can't fire up your PCR machine and start testing people. And I, and I hope everyone realizes that because there are a lot of federal agencies that impact laboratories, state and federal regulations that oversee the guidance of clinical testing and what that means. And really what it means is in, uh, in CLIA terms, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments, is anything that you do to examine materials derived from the human body for diagnosis, prevention, treatment, or assessment of health in a human being is governed by state and federal legislation. You are, you know, so you can't just throw even your own sample on a PCR machine in your garage uh, and do it legally. So um, with all those standards set, which are meant to protect the public, um, these are pretty high barriers. To, to get over if you're just a research lab. You're not used to having inspections or quality assurance officers or establishing what your pre-analytic and post-analytic process, um, processes are or doing competency testing on the people in your laboratory. That is just something very different. Uh, but looking at all this and with respect to um, uh, clinical testing, we felt that we had to do this, that we had to get into this despite the hurdles. And so we started this thing called the CLIA Hub. It's basically a pop-up CLIA lab here at UCSF BioHub. We're doing it in conjunction with UCSF under UCSF's CLIA license with the clinical directors. And the whole idea would be to facilitate rapid turnaround COVID-19 nucleic acid testing. So nothing fancy, just RT-PCR, but we wanna get it done fast, high throughput, and maintain that cadence so that people can get their results on time. Uh, and we'll talk about who we serve in a minute. And the beauty is we could leverage all those postdocs and graduate students who are otherwise just sitting at home twiddling their thumbs because they're not allowed to go back to lab. Uh, we have a hugely 
<laughs> overtrained workforce here that we could immediately put to the task uh, and execute testing on a scale that otherwise wouldn't have been possible. And so that was the goal. Now there's lots of obstacles and things in the way. One of them was a lot of state legislation. But fortunately, on March 11th, the governor in here issued an executive order that brought state personnel requirements in line more with federal requirements, which uh, uh, allowed our grad students and postdocs to be able to volunteer and actually uh, do clinical testing. So at March 11th, basically March 12th, it was go. That we knew we could actually do this legally and get into it. But logistically, how are we going to do this? I mean, it's really hard. There is just a lot to set up. All the infrastructure, who, where are you going to do it? How are you going to organize it? Where's your supply chain going to come from? Because at that time, as you recall, supply chain was a huge problem, still is in some areas. Everything from pipette tips to tubes to swabs, all that stuff was evaporating, especially if it had to be ordered overseas. If it was domestically available, much easier. If it was uh, anywhere you had to order outside the United States, it was a disaster. And then, you know, how are we going to pay for it? How are we going to do quality assurance? All these things are real concerns. So um, we had our, our clinical lab directors, Ed and Steve, and uh, we appointed our lab leads. So Emily Crawford is our task force leader. She's the one who's really spearheaded this whole effort and their second in command, Vita, here at the Biohub. And we put team leads in charge of every one of these different areas so that we could compartmentalize the problem and solve each thing in its own little uh, team and then come together to integrate them all. So that's what this is. So we have team leads in facilities, team leads on robots, team leads on reagent prep. Who preps the reagents every morning for the plates that have to be used? You know, who's handling sample intake and basically customer support? Who's handling the couriers uh, and all that? So all those things had to be sort of, you know, division of labor compartmentalized so that everybody could specialize and do their job uh, really well. And of course, all these include Biohub staff and a huge number of volunteers from UCSF. Now, what we're doing isn't exactly rocket science, right? We basically take in patient samples, which uh, have to be accessioned. Now, it shows accessioning happening at the UCSF clinical lab. Actually, we do all the accessioning here at the Biohub. If you don't know what accessioning is, it's basically you know, taking patient information and sticking it in a medical record. Sounds simple, but it's a huge pain in the butt. Uh, that I can't emphasize enough. It takes about half of our time, of the total time we spend. Uh, then we queue up those plates after they've been robotically transferred into 96 volt plates from tubes. They have to be de-swabbed, all that stuff. We extract RNA, we do qPCR, we generate a report and we return it for reporting out. That's basically what we do. Now. Uh, as a side thing, we also do viral genome sequencing of essentially all of our positives. And that feeds genomic epidemiology, which we'll talk about more towards the end. So on March 13th, right, we had just an empty space. We had a piece of lab space that we shared with UCSF. It's based, technically UCSF rented space here in the Biohub. And uh, we just converted that whole thing into our CLIA lab. So it was empty in the 13th. We started stockpiling reagents like crazy. One of the things that we did strategically is we looked at the CDC and WHO protocols for PCR testing for COVID-19, and we made a list of all the reagents and um, plastics and everything they use, and we made sure to uh, uh, source our suppliers domestically and avoiding anything on the CDC and WHO list because all that stuff was evaporating. And so that was strategically actually a really um, important move on, on our part. So uh, we stocked up, we have our command center, which is basically a big grease board. Uh, all our teams got together and figured out like how the protocols were gonna work, who was gonna do what. We had a teams of people calibrating all our robots. We begged, borrowed, we didn't steal, but we begged and borrowed and got like every robot we could from around the university, from biotech companies, from others who weren't using them and uh, brought them over and installed them so that we have the same robot every time. Now, one of the issues I mentioned was supply chain. And one of the things that dried up immediately was the swab and tube kit, like a swab with a tube with liquid in it, in our case, RNA shield, those things became hard to get. And it doesn't matter if we have qPCR spun up at the Biohub. If you can't provide a swab and a tube, there's no testing. And so uh, many of our partners who wanted to do testing could not do testing because they didn't have this. So we just felt that we had to solve sort of each problem as it came, and this was one of them. 
So you could fill, we were able to source our own empty tubes and we could fill them by hand from carboys of liquid. Um, and we knew we were able to solve the swab problem. That's another long story. But, you know, filling tubes by hand is a problem and we needed to get out tens of thousands of tubes all the time. So this is where just just in time engineering comes into play. I mean, this is nothing fancy, but basically our engineering team was able to put together what we call the bartender. And it basically fills tubes at a rate of 2000 per hour. And uh, we can basically use this thing to uh, create tens of thousands of tubes every day. And so we built a bunch of these and deployed them around uh, not only the Biohub, but lots of our partners uh, using them as well. Stanford, for example, uses the bartender. And it, it's, you know, this is nothing super complex, but having basically engineers on staff and an interdisciplinary team where when you know what you need and can have it 24 hours later up and running, that's really valuable. And so this, this, this idea that we have a bunch of mechanical and electrical engineers and others on the team at all times really made a difference during COVID-19. Another example early on is that we didn't have the larger clinical robots that could transfer from a clinical tube to a plate, like the Hamilton star letter star, which we actually have in operation now. But early on, you know, it was hard to get those. The, it was a question of whether the tips would come in, all kinds of things. So uh, in the absence of that, we came up with another engineering solution. I mean, it's just simple, but it's fun to show. If you're going to have people manually transfer from clinical tubes to plates, they cannot make a mistake. And so we engineered this little rig called Well Lit, which sits in the hood, the biosafety hood. You read the barcode from the patient and it tells you where to put the sample. But better than just telling you like, uh, like E8, wherever it needs to go, it actually illuminates the wells of the plate from below so you can see exactly where to pipette and not make a mistake. And then it records you know, all the data in a CSV file, which then transmits it to our laboratory information system so that all that stuff can be tracked along the way. And so here's Sarah Vasquez in the biosafety hood, you know, with live, you know, COVID samples from patients doing the hand transfer. Luckily, Hamilton's are online now and we do all that robotically. But in the early days, there was no option. You just, you had to do it. You, we weren't going to wait a month for a robot to come in to start processing samples. Okay, so, you know, Back to this, once this PCR is done, which is nothing fancy, it's TACMAN against two different probes, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, you can generate a report. And so you have to have positive controls, negative controls, uh, you know, contamination controls, and an algorithm for detecting whether something should be invalid or should be uh, retested again due to um, suspicion of cross-contamination or any of those things. And so the report gets automatically generated and sent to the clinical lab director, as well as the actual curves extracted from the PCR machine data. And so all those can be recorded and entered into the LIM system. All right, so uh, we basically went live with clinical testing eight days from March 12th to March 20th. After the go sign on March 12th, we were up and running and returned our first clinical result on March 20th. And since then, what we've been doing we increased our, our throughput, validated additional instruments, and then really made outreach to California. So who do we serve? So we serve California uh, counties in particular. Um, we serve about 24 of the 58 counties. So they're shown here in green. We're onboarding some additional ones. Some of these ones that are in blue now actually are green. Um, and uh, we started out slow and then ramped up testing progressively. And so as far away as Modoc or Siskiyou County, all the way to just closer to home, Contra Costa, Alameda, and so on. So we're really, really serving county departments of public health in outbreak investigations, including safety net hospitals, prisons, jails, and underserved communities. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So with 10 volunteers down in the CLIA lab, we can do a maximum of about 2,688 a day. Now, if we ran a second shift or third shift, you could theoretically double or triple that. But that's a single shift, single group of 10 people. Um, our July average is around 1,400. And to date, our volunteers have returned over 132,000 clinical tests to Californians. Free. Uh, we don't charge for any of this. So let me tell you about some of the results that we got while doing this. Uh, because not only are we doing county DPH testing, but we're also engaging with uh, great epidemiological investigations 
some of our colleagues like Dan Havlier and others are, are launching studies in our own backyard here in San Francisco to better understand the transmission of the virus. So one of these studies, which just recently published, is called the Mission Study. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about and then tell you about the follow-on to the Mission Study. So the Mission Study was the idea of um, testing a particular census tract, a four by four block area in the Mission District of San Francisco, which has a heavily Latinx community which was suspected to have a high viral prevalence. Uh, so in total, we did 4,160 people over like a five-day period. You can see this sort of ethnic breakdown here. Um, these include both uh, community members outside, a little bit outside the census tract, volunteers, and then about 3,000 people who either live or work in that census tract. So I'm just gonna give you the big take-home messages and then cruise through some other data. So one of the big ones is, of the people who are PCR positive, 90% said they could not work from home. That was one of the big take home message. Like if you can't shelter in place, you are disproportionately at risk for getting COVID-19. Seems obvious in retrospect, but you know, there was no legislation on the books at this time that allowed people to keep their jobs if they had to shelter in place. Like if a lot of people didn't show up, they got fired. And so this has actually resulted in new legislation here in California called Right to Recover uh, and others. So that's sort of an, a, a really interesting point here. The other interesting point is that the virus was disproportionately represented in the Latinx community in particular. So uh, there was a gender bias, 75% of the positives were male and 95% of the positives were Latinx. And in over 981 Caucasians in this particular sample, there was not a single positive. And so it says that even if you live or work in the same four block area of a city, your risk of the virus is not necessarily what your neighbor's risk is. And it really is uh, dependent on many other social determinants that people need to think about and keep in consideration. Who in our community cannot isolate? Who in our community is forced to go work on a job site to put food on the table? Those are the kind of risk factors that create this disproportionate and uneven representation of the virus. Uh, and frankly, um, make it difficult to stop. All right, so uh, the, other, the other thing that was important is this is early on, these, these results were coming in in April, was that 53% had no symptoms at all. And uh, this is one of the figures from the paper. What you could clearly see is that um, the distribution of symptomatic to asymptomatic people in terms of viral load measured by CT cycle was essentially no different. It's basically the same viral load. We have a lot more numbers on this and we can assure you that it's asymptomatic and symptomatic, no difference. Now, if you're antibody positive, your viral tires are much lower. That can actually stratify who you're looking at very quickly. Uh, and very few, only about 10% or so or 15%, of our asymptomatics on a two week follow-up went on to become symptomatic. So the majority of people who are asymptomatic stayed as asymptomatic. That was not widely appreciated when this first came out. And uh, again, if you seroconvert, your viral load drops fast. Uh, some quick notables uh, that we were also involved in before I get to the next part of the mission study. At the same time, uh, the, um, the BioHub was testing every single day in the Santa Rita jail the fifth, I think, largest jail in the United States. And that daily testing helped mitigate a potentially horrible outbreak. Now, we also engaged with San Quentin, which you know did have a horrible outbreak. We uh, did not do daily testing for them, nor did they do you know, quick turnaround testing. Uh, there, that's actually the subject of many news reports you've, I'm sure you've read. Uh, we were able to engage with them during the outbreak to protect at least one unit within San Quentin, the Unit H dorm, uh, and that was uh, very successful, but you know, because they were not doing daily rapid turnaround testing and their decisions to move prisoners from one facility to another precipitated a massive outbreak. And so it shows you what can happen when the virus gets into congregate settings. Now in the mission study, I talked about the right to recover legislation that's now um, already happening in San Francisco and the SAFER Act, which you know, also protects workers from being fired. And of course, it's resulted in new testing sites. So I'd like to tell you about some new results also that we've recently had 
at looking at um, transportation hubs. So we have a subway system in San Francisco called BART. Uh, a lot of those BART stations go through the mission. And so the idea was to conduct easy testing at these BART stations. You know, so the idea was, could you have low barrier hub-based testing uh, that made it really easy to get tested and uh, uh, provided us more data on who in the community was getting the virus and how we could prevent it. And so uh, these were the goals of the study. It's again, in partnership with the Latino task force in the mission, you've got to have good community partners when you execute these studies. It has to be integrated with the community's own goals to make these things effective. And that's what was done here and which is why these studies are so um, easy to pull off. It's also a collaboration with the city and with transportation agencies like BART and SFMTA. So uh, we did this, this only anterior nasal swabs are not doing the MP back to the brain swab anymore because we've shown that they're equivalent. We do all the CLIA, PCR, and then uh, they, uh, people can get their results uh, really fast. And part of this is this test to care concept. Like the faster you get a result and the faster you provide care to that family in isolation and quarantine, the faster and more effective that you are in blocking a transmission chain, which is what this is all about. So what did we learn? We learned that it is acceptable, it's feasible, it's high yield. You can do a hundred persons an hour at the BART station with just a limited volunteer crew. Uh, and we were registering a 9% um, PCR rate in San Francisco. I mean, sorry, at the BART station, which was much higher than the city's uh, overall prevalence, much higher. So that was uh, really interesting and also shined a light on what was going on. So what were the factors that made this successful or what did we learn? Uh, you know, number one is you've got to have the right ambience. You've got to have Spanish, in this particular case, Spanish speaking staff and volunteers. There should be no need for an appointment. You should have no need for a formal identification or evidence of health coverage. That's really a barrier to testing. If you're requiring those things, you will not get a lot of the people that you need. Of course, this should be done for free, obviously. And uh, doing it in the morning as opposed to later turned out to be a big deal. Um, so some, some results, 93% of the PCR positive people were Latinx. They had a seven fold higher risk than whites or Caucasians. And I think a, a big part of this is uh, many were unemployed, but uh, more importantly, 87% had low household income, less than $50,000 median household income and many lived in large congregate living settings. So like a median of six people in the house with a maximum of 26 people in the house. So these are living conditions that allow intra house spread, which is one of the main ways we're seeing the virus move through the community. Uh, because we did a deep questionnaire and when symptoms started and so on, we could also measure the viral load as a function of when symptoms were perceived to have started. And what you can see is in the first seven days, you know, there's a very steep drop off from what I would call astronomical viral loads, like CT cycles of 10 or 11, dropping off to a CT of 30 by day 10 or 12. And that really indicates that those first seven days are critical. You know, it's very unlikely that people are shedding active virus at a CT cycle of 30 and above. Uh, but those first seven days, you know, they're, they're quite something different. So we learned a lot from this and it showed us and taught us a lot of lessons about where we can put testing sites to dig deeper into the communities that are more adversely and disproportionately affected by COVID-19. The risk is not the same for everybody living even in the same city block. Uh, now, a couple other things that we learned that I think are interesting that I'll share with you. Uh, as you've probably seen, there's been news reports that show children, well, it depends on and what you, you, you know, how you interpret the data, but some research like this paper from Mass General suggests that children are silent spreaders of, uh, of SARS. And they claimed that basically their viral loads were higher than adults. And there's at least another paper from Journal of Pediatrics that appears to claim the same thing. Although in both their cases, their N, their number of samples is rather limited. Well, when you test 100,000 samples, you have a lot of N. So we could just directly go look at that. And so, um, here's the news from us. In the in three different age groups that were looked at the papers, uh, we see no statistical difference between kids less than five, teenagers, or five to 17, and those who are 18 and over. 
zero statistical difference. They're indistinguishable. Um, so good news, silence, are, you know, children aren't seem to be like hyper viremic in ways that some of the media spun it. Bad news is the viral load is just like everybody else. It's really no different. Um, and so we're very confident of those results. And we've actually compared our results to others at other institutions and they see the same thing on their testing. No, no significant viral load difference between children and adults. So that's a take home message for you. And if you wanted to break it up by different uh, age decades, one to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, no matter how you break it up, you know, you're not, not really seeing a big difference here in the stratification of viral load versus age. Uh, and the benefit here is this large numbers of N. What about gender? No, not significant either. No significant gender difference between viral load and age group and gender. And so not really seeing uh, the, some of the, not recapitulating some of the things that were seen in these published reports. And I, I frankly think that those reports were flawed technically. So uh, what else have we learned doing all this before we get to the genomic stuff? Well, you know, there's a, well, last time I looked, there was over 175 EUA approved just RT-PCR tests alone. Now this is really interesting um, because some of the WHO guidelines indicate that these tests could get away with only using a single probe. That is, you know, these are usually TACMAN assays, so only assaying one part of the viral genome. And uh, we now know that 36 of the 175 UAs employ just a single target. And so is that a problem? Well, I don't know. Let's take a look. So if we look at most of our results, you know, uh, it's actually pretty good concordance between a probe to the E gene and the N gene by viral load and CT cycle. We really don't see much of a big difference. Now, you end up having differences right at the very limit of detection, uh, which you might expect due to some stochastic nature when you get really close to your limit. That's expected. Um, and so one could look at this and say, yeah, maybe we only need one probe. Two probes is not really necessary, but let's take the example of Madera County. So we started getting samples from Madera County in which we consistently saw the uh, N gene probe perform poorly with respect to the E gene. Not all Madera samples, but big clusters of Madera samples. And that made us a little concerned that there was something else going on here. And so actually we, we of course sequence all these genomes all the time. And when we sequence the genomes from Madera County, what we found was indeed there is a mutation in one of the primer binding sites of the N gene, our forward primer, that resulted in a pretty significant delta CT shift. Um, and if we then comp compensate for it by putting in the mutant primer, it then reverses all of that, proving that this mutation is indeed the source of the CT cycle difference. And this could result in, uh, if you're using only a single probe and it's only the end gene, you could be susceptible to false negatives due to this. Uh, and we should have, in, this should be anticipated. The virus is mutating. And of course, there are going to be mutations in the areas in which your probes are at. So something to take into consideration. Now, while this mutation has arised in Madeira, I'm showing a phylogram here um, uh, of full-length genomes around the world, and the ones here are the ones in Madeira, this yellow stripe up here. Um, they have arisen independently in other clades throughout the world. So this isn't just a private Madeira thing that's never been seen anywhere else. Uh, and this will, you know, this has happened before, and it's all going to happen again as well. So speaking of viral genomics and the whole genomes, I have a few words to say about that and just tell you what we're doing there. So um, what, is, what does it mean to do viral genomics? So just, you know, the basic concept is, which I'm sure most of you are all familiar with, is that the virus makes mutations and it makes mutations on the, you know, the rate of one every two to three transmission events, which is every two to three weeks, given, you know, a certain interval of uh, serial transmission. And this fact, allows you to track the mutations. Since all the previous mutations are inherited, you can then track which things were inherited identical by descent, and that allows you to then um, you know, put together a phylogeny. And so next strain and GSAID and many others have put together these really wonderful visualizations that show you the global distribution of clades 
dating all the way back to the very beginning of the outbreak in early December, late November, where this thing was a very small pool of different variants that then um, became, you know, worldwide explosion of different mutants. But, you know, the virus's occasional mutation is what actually empowers this ability to track things. So why is this useful? I mean, other than, you know, the basic biology and understanding if there's not synonymous mutations that affect viral function or something interesting like that, why should you care? Like, what's the point of sequencing viral genomes? One of the points is that you can actually use it epidemiologically. You could confirm or rule out chains of, of uh, transmission. You could enable traceback for cases that didn't have a known exposure. Uh, you could identify a new lineage that is entering into a particular geographic area or group of people. That also helps understand your circulation. And not only that, you could estimate based on the number of mutations that you see, what the community transmission you know, level looks like, what that viral population level looks like, even though you're not directly observing the transmissions themselves. So just an example of how we use it in the mission study, um, and then I'll tell you how we're sort of operationalizing it every day. So in the mission district study, the same study I showed before, on the left, what, we're sh what I'm showing is these red dots are all um, positive from the mission district. And uh, over here are the global clays. And what it shows, and by the way, the X scale is mutations, you can think of that as time too, is that there have been multiple introductions into that mission population. It wasn't one virus that seeded a community and took over. It was several different introductions from all over the place. And we can go into greater detail on the right. So on the right, now we're showing basically who lives in the census tract. That would be a round, a round symbol. Who works in the census tract, a triangle. And then the households in green, like who lives together. And then layered on top of that is the antibody results. So both the antibody and the genomes. And so take, for example, this. This is a person who's antibody positive, so at the tail end of their infection, because they seroconverted, who transmitted to, uh, you know, or is very, very close in the transmission train, right? We can't prove they transmitted it, but it's an identical virus. So they have to be extremely proximal to these three individuals who all live together, who are all residents who live there. Um, and they haven't seroconverted yet. So this, is a very, this came first, then these guys get infected. After that, this person also infected um, a worker who lives outside the census tract with three other individuals that worker transmitted it to two other individuals in the household. This person first before this one, because this one has a new mutation, most likely. And then this worker retransmitted it to back into the census tract. So people who live there give it to workers, workers give it to their housemates, their housemates then transmit it back to people who live in the census tract. So that's a circulation of the virus, round and round it goes. And so this gives you sort of an idea of the granularity and accuracy and precision with which you can actually track the flow of virus in a community. But how are we gonna, I mean, this is fine for a tiny little four block area, but how are we actually operationalize that statewide? So that's COVID Tracker. It's a partnership with CDPH. Um, and uh, what the idea is to create an end-to-end -end program that would enable our counties to routinely use this genomic data in their response. They would generate data every single week it would get analyzed at the biohub sequence, assemblies built, all that stuff, all the trees. Those would be retransmitted back to the county DPH. And then we have hands-on sessions with them to layer over their metadata to understand where actionable intervention can take place. So I'll say more about that in a minute. But you know, right now we have partnerships with, actually it's over 19 DPHs now. And actually, this number is a little dated. We, um, we have more than 1,600 assembled genomes, more coming all the time. And we spend hours and hours every single week with training sessions with different counties throughout California to help them interpret their data. And the whole point is capacity building. We want these folks to come online and be able to interpret and use this data in a meaningful way. Um, and so far, uh, it, there's, we've been involved in at least 10 investigations that, allow, that actually resulted in actions. These include investigations of a fish packing plant, fruit packing plant, nursing homes, prisons, and more. Um, now, actually that, that number of, about the number we contributed to the public database is a little bit dated. We'll have to update that, uh, but we've contributed a lot. So the week sort of looks like this. 
On Tuesday, for example, Orange County would send us, you know, 80 of the positive samples that they think are interesting to assemble and sequence. All the wet lab work, you know, starts by, by Wednesday. And then Thursday, Friday, you have um, all the, the sequences done. Saturday's bioinformatics day, all the genome assemblies and tree constructions get done. And then Monday, we're ready for a weekly call back with Orange County to be able to interpret and act on that data and put it into context with their other information. And simple ones look like this. I'm just showing you a simple one that's been anonymized, but this is an Orange County one where they had three nursing facilities. They didn't know if they were linked. The genomic sequencing data definitively actually links them together, even though patient movement between the facilities was known to be highly limited. And the conclusion was actually that there were part-time staff moving between these three facilities. And that was where the interventions could take place, was limiting staff movement between them and actually getting staff tested because that was the most likely vector of transmission between the three facilities. Now, a more dramatic example is San Quentin. Uh, as you all know, um, or read about perhaps, in May, late May, 121 inmates were transferred from Chino via San Quentin, via seven hour bus ride. That's gotta be no fun. Um, and by early July, over 1,200 inmates were infected. That number is actually much, much higher now. I don't know what the final total is, but it's essentially almost everybody in San Quentin. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the questions early on was, was that really the source of the, the infection? You know, I'm sure it was, but what's the proof that it wasn't coincidental, that guards didn't just bring it in from different sides or, you know, visitors or something? How do we know it was the Chino transfer? And so if it really was a point introduction, all the viruses should be actually identical or linked. And so showing in a circular phylogenetic tree here, indeed, all the San Quentin samples are very tightly linked. And actually we can track the transmission of the virus through the facility. And if we could layer that on the, epi, on the, on the metadata where each block was and where each tower was, we'd really have a good picture of how a, a, you know, a virus such as this can spread through a facility so fast and by what means. So um, too late to save San Quentin and uh, is a tragedy in many different ways, but I hopefully will inform how future facilities are built and managed from a public health standpoint to prevent something like this from happening again. So the idea for COVID Tracker, and again, this is a collaboration with CDPH, our state partners, County DPH, the Biohub and CZI, is to generate that data, analyze, interpret, and act on it. But we wanna engineer ourselves out of the loop. We don't wanna be doing this forever. We wanna build capacity such that CDPH has a statewide network of NGS labs that they could use to build all these sequences or do it themselves. Or maybe when one of these new mega testing facilities that they're building. We want turnkey bioinformatics solutions that allow anybody to, to do this with really you know, low, uh, low compute needs so that they could you know, basically get on these trees and make uh, conclusions based on rich visualizations. We basically want them to write the genomic epi playbook and we want the adopters to become our trainers. That is what the goal is. And it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a long haul. It's gonna be tough. And it's gonna be tough because all of our county DPHs, and I know this is different in different states, but in California, you know, they're poorly resourced. They always have been for decades and decades. And we're feeling that right now more than ever. This is an email uh, to Josh, one of our data scientists, uh, when we provided data back to them to, trying to set up meetings. Uh, you know, we'd really like to use this investigation outbreaks, but we don't have the staff to link investigation data to the samples and look at clusters. They don't even have an epidemiologist on staff. So, you know, we need to solve some of these basic county level Department of Public Health staffing problems and empower people with better tools and resources to um, fix this problem. And it's, part of it's gonna be the state's responsibility. We have to take public health seriously. And it hasn't been, frankly, for decades. So what are the lessons learned here? I'll, I'll end up with just a couple of uh, lessons learned. You know, fast turnaround time. That's probably the most important thing. You've got to get results back quick. You know, if a Quest or LabCorp returns the results in 10 days, it's meaningless. And I think none of those companies should get reimbursed or paid if they return a result in more than 48 hours. I don't understand why that isn't federal legislation already. Um, you've got to have freely accessible testing and you've got to focus it 
on the right populations. Who are your vulnerable populations? Who is most likely to get this virus and how can you stop transmission chains? It's not everybody. It's very uneven. And I've told, I've already said this, but our patchwork of, you know, incompatible reporting systems and information systems and data transfer systems and electronic medical record systems is nothing but a distraction and a hampering from getting the job done. All these incompatible systems just slow everybody down. And it's, you know, also kind of criminal that we don't have a nationwide medical record numbers, identifications and systems. Uh, I told you about viral loads in asymptomatic, symptomatics and kids and all that. Uh, hopefully you have been clear there. I think it's clear to everyone that I work with and hopefully you too, that uh, the leadership in this country and at the state level, at the county levels and everywhere have just not been sufficient. And you know, our reliance on uh, that kind of leadership has failed us. Um, our reliance on global supply chains has failed us. And we need to do better at all levels. Uh, I think genomics can also add critical intelligence that isn't being used now. now. And of course, our students and postdocs are awesome. Now, where's this all going? Yesterday, I was at the BART station volunteering at one of our pop-up test sites, testing community members, and we were actually prototyping a new direct antigen testing card from Abbott. So this is a simple paper card that gives you a 15 minute result. Um, now, I don't have all the data to report on how it corresponds to our clear results yet. However, I'm feeling very encouraged. Uh, and I think that these simple, really trivial paper assays, they don't need an instrument, they don't need a computer, they detect a virus directly, might be game changers, uh, not just from Abbott, but from many other companies too. We're gonna to need testing rule changes right now because theoretically, or actually not theoretically, by the rule of the law, these cards are supposed to only be used by CLS technicians, reported out by a molecular pathologist, not approved for use in asymptomatic individuals, yada, yada, yada. Those rules have gotta change. You can imagine a time when a school nurse has a stack of these cards and you can just test kids whenever you want. Um, we need to think differently about clinical testing in the age of rapid, fast paper assays. We need to think definitely about who's allowed to run them and who's allowed to report them. And if you could do them on yourself, because right now it's not allowed to do it on yourself. Now they are gonna be lower sensitivity, but is that okay? Probably, it's probably okay because I showed you that graph about symptoms, viral load and the drop off being very steep. Um, and maybe something like this is gonna be the route forward that we've all been looking for because we can't keep doing what we're doing now indefinitely because you know, we're barely keeping up and it's not really working. So um, that, that is where I'm gonna end up here. Um, I know we only have eight minutes left. We have huge numbers of volunteers, over 187 volunteers, only some of which are shown here, volunteered their time, countless hours with no pay to uh, conduct free testing for Californians. Um, it's a huge effort on the part of uh, UCSF basic scientists and grad students and postdocs. And uh, there's our cool t-shirt that we gave out. Every, every effort's gotta have a cool t-shirt. And tons and tons of people at the Biohub made this possible. And of course it wouldn't have been possible without the funding of Chan Zuckerberg as well. So I'm gonna stop there. Joe, that was amazing and super inspirational. Um, I know we only have you for a couple minutes here before you've gotta run off and save some other people. Uh, so we'll try to make this really efficient. Um, yeah, that, that was the top of my um, uh, question list was about antigen testing. Um, yeah, can, can you say a little more about what, what, what do we need to angle for with antigen testing? Well, now, I'm very, I'm very um, uh, hopeful. Uh, you know, the, the early tests that we've done with the Abbott assay, which is one of the only ones that doesn't that so far doesn't require a computer or a reader or anything complicated like that. Very, very encouraging, very encouraging. You know, I'll have more data to talk about in the next week or so, because we're gonna correlate it back to CLIA PCR, right? And so we'll really know how viral load corresponds to the results on the cards. And so that's, that's gonna be the gold standard that we'll compare against. And so I'll have a lot to say, but I'm just kind of giving you my off the cuff impressions having been on site using it is that um, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. And you know, Abbott's not gonna be the only company out there. It's probably gonna be five or six companies by Q1 2021 that have direct antigen paper card assays. And so uh, I, I'm hopeful that the supply chain and the availability of these cards 
which right now they're really hard to get, mm -hmm. um, is going to open up. And, but we're going to need to have a different way of thinking about them. We can't have – what good is a little paper card assay if they can only be run by CLIA technicians and reported out by pathologists? I mean, that's crazy. Uh, we're going to need changes in the way we think about self-testing. And, and we're not – you know, legislation and state and federal guidelines aren't there yet. Um, so we need changes. I'm hopeful. Okay. Uh, yes. A Andy uh, asks, uh, what's the cost per sample of the, uh, of the antigen test? Oh yeah. So Abbott right now is, is saying $5, but that's, you know, with competition, you know, that's going to drop to a dollar before soon. So, you know, $5 today, probably a dollar by January is what I'm guessing, especially as more companies get in into it. So I think that's really, um, you know, when you're at a dollar an assay or even less and you're 15 minutes to get a result and it doesn't require a computer or anything else, I think we're in a new world of testing, one that, that's mm -hmm. going to be a lot more efficient and uh, widespread. And so I think, you know, it's not going to replace super sensitive testing for outbreak investigation, hospitals, infection control and things like that. But that's okay. We're talking about doing this kind of testing in low prevalence schools, other congregate settings, you can imagine this maybe being used at sporting events. I don't know, but you, you get the idea. I think it's, it's actually going to be a very, a very useful tool and it's cheap. Yeah, uh, and, and he clarifies he actually meant your uh, oh, sorry. RTCR. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, our, our, our cost of goods to run the test is $14. Um, actually, it's, and, and if we count in labor and all the other stuff, um, albeit we've done a lot of this with volunteers and we don't pay, uh, you know, we're, we're probably around $19 or so. And it depends on like how many you do in a day and like all that stuff because there's a fixed labor cost. So it's pretty cheap, but it's not as cheap as a dollar. So I, I think that's a game changer. Um, yeah, it, it, Kim uh, has related questions. What, what do you think about saliva instead of anterior nasal and what about pooling samples? Yep. So we haven't actually tested direct antigen on, on saliva versus nasal. The EUA on those cards that we used is only approved for, you know, nasal swabs. And so we stuck to the rules and we just did nasal swabs, but you can bet obviously that we'd love to look at uh, saliva on the card as well. Um, you know, the mucoid content is different. It's a different sort of sample. I, we've played with saliva in our own clinical testing here. And, you know, sometimes you get half of somebody's lunch in the tube. You know, it's kind of um, complicated. Let's just put it that way. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that was also for RT-PCR. Yeah, for RT-PCR. So, so for, we've examined saliva here for RT-PCR. Okay. And um, we're not big fans. Uh, we're not big fans because of that mucoid content. It messes with our robots because there's food in, food in it and other yeah. things. Yeah. We actually think that the sensitivity is better with a nasal swab. But like I said, we're not talking NP. You don't go tickle your brain. You just right. do little anterior nares. It's like one, two, three, you're done. It's really easy. Yeah, yeah um, but how is supply chain on swabs holding? No problem. Up? We got great supply chain on swab. Swab, swab plus the tube plus the material inside it, which is RNA shield is less than, a, it's about a dollar. Let's just call it $1. And so that's not really uh, a, a barrier for us anymore. We solved that many months ago. Okay. Um, hey, I had a, I had a quick one. Um, do, do you guys have enough in to make a statement about uh, the D614G mutation? Like Trevor Bedford saw higher type, slightly higher titers with that mutant. Uh, we do have a big N. Uh, uh, I would have to go back and see what the latest shows. I know that analysis um, some time ago, you know, several weeks or a month ago, did not show a statistical difference. Okay. But, you know, there's a lot more samples, so we'll have to go back and redo the analysis and see if we see that. So don't, don't take that as like a gospel from our samples yet. We'll go back and take a look as the situation evolves. We're tracking a number of interesting new mutations. Mm -hmm. uh, but so far, we have not seen something that is a real tight correlation with viral load to, to this date. Okay. But, you know. Uh, we'll hey, hey, we got, we got another question. Uh, do you have metadata on like indoor, outdoor, PPE, et cetera, and how that translated to CT and et cetera? 
well, no, maybe not CT, but actually like who gets the virus. Sure. So in, uh, especially in our BART studies and things like that, our deep questionnaire is, do you work inside? Do you work on a job site outside? Do you, how many people do you work with? Uh, do you wear your mask all the time? Like, you know, all that stuff. Now, of course, you're relying on a lot of self-reporting and self-reporting isn't exactly always accurate and all that. But uh, in general, um, we do see big trends with the fact that people who are not able to work inside on their own, if you work outside or on a job site, like a construction site, you are at more risk. Um, hey, I know we have to let you go. Um, can, can we just ask one more yeah, about... Let's push it. It's 12 o'clock. I'll be a minute late to my next one. Okay. Um, um, how can you... I mean, this is a vast body of knowledge that you guys have accumulated. How can you best transfer that? What, what sort of entities would be best to receive that body of knowledge and how can that be facilitated? Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, really, really good question. Uh, I've been frustrated because our current sort of traditional academic publishing system doesn't work for that. It's too slow. It's not meant for this. Um, and even by our archive, right? Things are now lost in by archive because there's 10,000 things in there and you have no yeah. idea where to look for things and it's become a mess. So um, while I, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of preprints and open access publishing, that still doesn't feel like the right model. And so I think we need something different, especially for these labs that are doing high throughput testing to aggregate and pool and look at the data in real time. Because most of these labs, you know, aren't, aren't showing you graphs like I showed you today on the CT cycles and like all this stuff. Where's that data from LabCorp or Quest or all these others? Nobody knows. And so, that we don't have the right mechanism. And I think we need something to improve the information transfer to make this data more widely known and also to make it more actionable for all these other folks trying to do frankly the same thing. Um, I'm open to suggestion. I'd love to know what the thoughts are. It'd be great if like Hughes got involved in doing something like that. Um, you know, uh, it, the, the traditional model of, you know, publishing and waiting three or four months to get your eLife paper in there is not gonna cut it. Mm -hmm. And hey, so just a quick follow up. You said other people are trying to do this. Do you have people reaching out to you asking for protocols? And oh yeah, all the time. And of course we put our entire how to build a CLIA lab on protocols.io. It's all up there. Uh, but again, you know, how would they know to look for it or find it and things yeah. like this. So even though we publicly get, give this stuff out, it's hard for people to find it. So yeah, I just get emails from lab directors and random labs and other places and it's a lot of the data that I showed you today has been transferred from lab to lab by word of mouth mm -hmm. uh, and emails and slacks and stuff. And that's kind of sad. And, and it's happening too fast to be a traditional publishing model. It's too quick. Things are happening too fast. Yeah. I mean, do you think there's a possibility that an, an organization could be spun up that would then help distribute. I mean, obviously you have to work with the DPHs. It's supposed but, to be the CDC. Well, right, but yeah. I'm well, talking about CDC and their weekly, you know, morbidity and mortality report would have been the mechanism to do that. A, yeah. a weekly report that gets the data out to everybody. As we now know, that report has been politically corrupted. Right. So and I, 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 yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe next year that'll change, but I'm not, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I gotta go folks. Okay, all right. Great. Hopefully that was informative and useful for you all. That was super great. Yeah. That was, that's great, Jeff. Awesome, man. Keep up the good work. Everybody keep safe. All right, you see you, man. Bye. All right, bye.